We're finally at our last concept for this semester, so we're going to talk about elimination. So that includes, we're going to talk about peeing and pooping. So let's get started. So when we're talking about elimination, we need to know what it is. And of course, it's the excretion of waste from the body. So when we talk about bowel elimination, this is going to be the passage and the dispelling of stool, getting rid of things through the intestinal tract uh, by ways of our intestinal, intestinal smooth muscle contraction, also known as your peristalsis. Then we have urinary elimination, and of course this is the passage of urine through the urinary tract. And so this goes from the kidneys through the ureter to the bladder to the uh, sphincter, bladder sphincter, to the urethra. What I'd like for you to do is to make sure that you go back through and review your anatomy and physiology dealing with the GI system and the GU system. So uh, just going back and just kind of ref uh, refresh your memories. I really like this slide when it talks about elimination and it splits it up into renal and intestinal. So when you look at the concepts and how things interrelate with each other, when we think about renal, uh, one of the things is retention, and of course this is the retainment of urine in the bladder. And when urine is retained in the bladder, someone is um, feeling very full and they get uncomfortable, and so the bladder becomes distended. Uh, we do know that urinary retention and the lack of uh, being able to eliminate all the urine out of the bladder can cause an infection. So when we look at bladder distension, um, you, I don't, I'm not sure if you learned how to do this yet or not, but when you assess a patient, the most quickest way to assess if they have a full bladder is just by palpation. And this is feeling that fullness um, over the suprapubic area and you will be able to feel that. And that means that the bladder is full. If you can feel it, it's full. So bladder distension. The other thing is control. Um, this is actually having to deal with incontinence. So having the inability to be able to control uh, urine or leakage, leakage of urine uh, through the sphincter uh, and out through the meatus. Again, both excuse me, both of these can actually lead to discomfort as well. So your incontinence and control, also to your uh, retention, can all lead to uh, discomfort. When we talk about the intestinal um, tract system, retention of stool can lead to constipation. The inability to be able to expel the stool, it becomes very hard and hard to eliminate. This can um, also uh, bring us to intestinal in, uh, control, and this can lead to incontinence. It doesn't necessarily mean if someone's incontinent of urine, they're also incontinent of stool and vice versa. So uh, again, constipation and that retention and also incontinence can both lead to discomfort. So when our patients have a loss of control um, of either urine or feces, um, it makes us think of three type, um, three uh, issues. One of those is the skin breakdown. And remember um, when we talked about tissue integrity and we talked about incontinence with that concept, uh, the skin can break down due to the acidic um, makeup of the urine and or the feces. So it's very important that we keep our patients clean and dry, uh, making sure that we do good peri care, we clean their bottoms, uh, soap and water, soap. If we have to use some type of barrier method, let's do that. But um, it can definitely be one of the top priorities for skin breakdown, especially in those areas. The other things, it changes their daily activity. Imagine going through each day and wondering, am I going to have an accident? Am I going to need another Depends? Do I need, you know, what do I carry this in? So it starts to um, uh, affect your daily activities. Um, you know, not knowing if I'm going to, you know, you know, when I'm going to have to go to the bathroom and can I get to a bathroom? Can I get up to a place where I can go change? 
It also starts to change social relationships because many times people just don't want to deal with it or they're embarrassed. And so these are some consequences that our patients deal with. When a patient has urinary retention, this is when the sphincter does not open for either the urine to uh, come out or maybe there's some type of blockage. It could be uh, uh, scar tissue or the sphincter may not be working correctly or something is wrong with the flap there at the sphincter. And so this will cause the patient to have a buildup of urine volume in their bladder and then the bladder becomes distended. Uh, with this distension, again, um, we talked about how bacteria can build up in that bladder, but also there can be a black backflow of urine up through the urinary tract up to the kidneys, which could lead to an infection all the way up to the kidneys. So not only in the bladder, but up to the kidneys. Also, too, um, sometimes we may have um, patients who may have to have the uh, ureters uh, urethra or even the re renal pelvis dilated to help to open those um, tubes for elimination. If a patient is having difficulty with retention, this could lead to polonephritis or renal atrophy where the uh, kidney um, isn't working and it starts to die off or it can be an inflammation or inf an, um, infection. So it's very important that we keep this urine flow and keep things flushed out. So uh, we're going to look for those blockages. One of the reasons for bowel retention is uh, ignoring the urge to go or someone has decreased peristalsis. Uh, ignoring the urge to go can be from little kids who are afraid to go to the bathroom, um, they're afraid they're going to get flushed down the toilet, so lots of times uh, having a bowel movement is the last thing they're potty trained with, or it's not cool to go to school, um, or it's not the right time, um, it's an inconvenient time, you can't find a place, you're traveling, uh, maybe on vacation, um, so you ignore that urge and you wait until a better time to go, or it can be due to decreased peristalsis, which is uh, less times comes from either opioid or uh, medications uh, or pain medications or someone who's been immobile. And so we want them moving around to increase that motility. Um, when someone does have bowel retention, it can cause the, um, the stool will remain in the rectum and it will begin to harden and dry and so it's harder to pass which will lead to constipation. If someone cannot expel that stool sometimes it is retained in the rectum and it can't move and then more of a stool uh, moves down and it begins to harden and someone can become what we call impacted. Now there will be a little bit of leakage of uh, watery stool from around that area uh, but this has to be digitally removed. Uh, it is difficult. It's painful for the patient. Um, and sometimes we also see this in our patients who have some type of, um, who's had a stroke or um, uh, maybe some type of paralysis. And uh, some of those patients get impacted very easily. And so they have to be disimpacted on a regular basis. So let's think about some of our populations at risk. So when we think about age, which I'm going to bring us down to below, but gender, uh, men seem to be able to go easier than women and more on a regular basis, usually more often, might be due to diet and exercise and increased metabolism. Uh, that will help men to go more than women. Uh, women seem to go less and have more issues with the bowel. Um, race I'm really thinking more of culture and this would have to deal with the types of foods someone eats. Um, when we think about our populations at risk for bowel and urinary elimination children especially are little toddlers who are learning to potty train uh, some of them are afraid to go to the bathroom um, so they uh, may hold it or it's a strange place or they're afraid to go um, some of them are afraid of the toilet, but they're going to get flushed down. Um, little kids um, want to play outside and don't want to come in, so they hold their urine or their stool. To, and uh, this can actually lead to problems um, if they do this on a continuous basis. 
in school, a lot of kids don't want to go to the bathroom at school, so they'll hold it, um, which can also increase their problems. Our pregnant women, uh, when the uterus starts to grow, um, it actually link is tilted back and it's actually putting pressure on the bladder. Uh, so when a woman's first pregnant, the beginning growth of the fetus in the first trimester will put pressure on the bladder and she will go quite often, a lot more frequently than she normally goes. Within the second uh, trimester, um, it lifts up off the bladder. She may not have issues with going to the bathroom frequently to urinate, but then she starts to have problems with some constipation. The um, intestines are kind of pushed upward and also to uh, the stomach it becomes flatter and so it's not as round and can't hold as much so her not being able to eat as as much as she could in the past plus the intestine and then the colon is also pushed back so there's not a whole lot of room there so she starts to have issues with constipation and the third trimester is the uh, uterus becomes very enlarged um, the issues with constipation and the passage of stool is increased, but now the whole weight of that uterus and the baby is now resting on her bladder again. So she's going to go to the bathroom very, very frequently. As we age, we don't eat as often, we don't drink as much, and we lose that thirst sensation, we start to lose our taste buds. We don't eat as much food and we're not as active. So our, um, our, um, uh, use of going to the or us going to the bathroom as often decreases. Um, so again, you, you won't see someone elderly having a bowel movement and on a regular basis, or um, or as often as they were, and not going to urinate as often as they were. However, the elderly are very fixated on their stool. Um, they they're very upset if they haven't gone at least once a day but or some of them are even worried that they haven't gone after each meal and so we do run the risk of our elderly patients abusing laxatives um, to help them to go to the bathroom which can actually lead to constipation because um, the uh, peristalsis starts to decrease because it doesn't work on its own. It's used to the motility from the laxative and uh, it also causes dehydration because of the fluid that is lost along with the stool and can cause many uh, individuals to have diarrhea. So um, those are some of the issues in our popu different populations. What I'd like for you to to do is also to make sure in class that you look over your um, diagnostic test along with your medications and please make sure that you're reviewing for your key terms quiz uh, the week we come back from Thanksgiving so please make sure you do review that um, and are ready for class. When we talk about some of our diagnostic tests, some of our lab tests or your analysis, and this is looking at specific gravity, we're looking at for white blood cells, red blood cells, um, kind of find out what's going on in the in the urine and breaking it down. We can also do your bun, which is a blood urea nitrogen uh, test and creatinine, and this is looking at kidney clearance and how well our kidneys are functioning. It can also tell us if our patient is dehydrated or not. The other thing is we're going to can do a culture. So um, we can actually um, do um, a, a test to see if we have our patient on the correct antibiotic. So is it a gram positive or a gram negative stain that's causing an infection? And also to um, if not, we can change the antibiotic. Usually they will give them a um, broad spectrum antibiotic such as Bactrim or um, Cipro um, until we get the cultures back. We can also check for occult blood and occult means hidden. So it may be hidden blood in the urine or it could be hidden blood in the stool. Uh, sometimes we can actually see the blood. Um, a patient will uh, urinate and you'll actually see bloody urine or pink pink tinge to the urine, but other times uh, we'll get the analysis back and there are red blood cells and uh, we, we don't even see it in the urine, but it's hidden, so it's occult. Same thing with the stool. Uh, we can get a stool sample. Uh, yes, and nurses do play and poop. We have our sticks and we 
get right there, right there in the middle of the stool, and we get our sample, and um, we'll send that off to the lab, and they'll tell us if there's blood in that stool. Sometimes our patients are um, do have a, a bloody stool, and you can actually see the blood, or they'll have the dark tarry stool. So um, it just depends, but if it's a cult, that means it's hidden. We can also do different tests and scans. We have x-rays, uh, CT scans, um, MRIs. Um, if with the MRI or, MRI or ultrasound, sometimes they will um, want contrast. It's very important that we ask our patient if they're allergic to um, iodine or if they're allergic to shellfish because of the uh, dye that we use. So it's very important that we ask about that. And um, the most important thing is knowing how to prepare our patients for the test and then how to prepare them for after the test and what to expect, such as do they have to have an empty bladder or does the bladder need to be full? Do they need to have um, a clean bowel? Do they need to be MPO? Um, do, uh, you know, uh, you know, do they have to lie still? Um, if it's a more of a invasive type of uh, test, you know, looking out for signs of infection after after the test, uh, what what to expect during the test, how they're going to feel after the test, are they going to be sore? Um, a couple, of, uh, one of the big preps that we know of is the colonoscopy, and the colonoscopy is as you talk to patients is to um, make sure that they know that there is a, a big prep before. It usually takes about two days before they have their colonoscopy. They'll go through a prep. Um, afterwards, it's very easy, and during the procedure, it's very quick and easy. It's usually the prep, so we need to make sure they know that. They may even have a cystoscopy or uroscopy, um, so they'll go in, and um, many men are afraid because they say, you've got to put a scope where? And um, what we'll do is we do let them know that we do uh, insert lidocaine to help to numb them up um, when, before we put this in. Sometimes we may have to dilate um, the urethra with um, and uh, it's a metal type of metal rod like thing that they'll stick in there and they increase it by a little bit in size each time to help to stretch the urethra. Um, or they may have to lie on a table, fill up their um, bladder and um, maybe pee on the, um, to see a urine flow study, uh, to see the, how the uh, urine passes through the body. And that can be very um, distressing for many patients because they just cannot go to the bathroom laying down on a table. Um, also too, uh, we may do um, a test where we have a uh, test and see how well the bladder empties. And we can have our patient uh, I think it's two liters of, uh, of water they'll have to drink and they have to be completely full and then they'll have them they'll uh, do an ultrasound on the bladder with it full then they'll have them go void and then they have a post void ultrasound to see how well their bladder is emptying out if they've had issues with infections. So our one, number one thing is prevention. So with primary prevention, making sure our patients know to stay hydrated, to drink plenty of fluids. This is going to help with urine and in, with the bowel. Had a very good uh, diet, adequate uh, dietary fiber. We're going to make sure they have regular toileting practices and not to ignore urges and to take their time uh, so they can empty completely. Regular exercise is, is excellent and it can actually help for the bladder, but it can also help with the stool. And I'm still not sure about avoidance of environmental contamination. Um, I'm not quite sure what that what they're talking to there, but um, the above uh, bullets are the ones I'm going to concentrate on. Again, when we talk about clinical management and screenings, colonoscopy screening, it's very important that we let our patients know when they should have this done. And it is usually um, individual's 50th birthday present. And um, usually they'll have to come back in 10 years if everything looks good. Uh, occult blood screening, we do um, that um, if 
someone has uh, some type of intestinal issue or disease process, they may have to have it done more frequently or earlier, but it's not a routine screen, but it is one that is done ever so often. Prostate scan, uh, cancer screening, um, this is for gentlemen, and um, around between ages of 40 to 50, they'll have their prostate screening done. Um, also, too, we will be getting PSA levels um, to do check, check their prostate screen, and um, uh, the prostate actually will increase in size a little bit at a time. So it's a gradual increase. So it is a part of the aging process. When we worry about prostate cancer is when there are large or huge uh, jumps in the PSA levels. That gives us concern and so they may have to do further testing. Uh, for this, but it's very important that we tell our patients how often they should have these tests, when they should have these um, procedures, and anything that might, you know, cause them to not have the uh, the screening uh, for some reason or other. When we think about treatments, um, different strategies um, depends on what's going on. Maybe it's an underlying issue, maybe it's something new. Um, many times we can, um, we try to do things with diet and exercise and fluids, trying to help our patients. But then again, sometimes we may need medications. Um, it may need stool softeners, such as Ducalate, um, uh, Ducasate, um, uh, may be used to soften the stool, um, may have to um, give something uh, more potent, uh, may need um, so something such as uh, peridium for uh, UTI, someone is having spasms and um, a lot of pain so they may need an anesthetic. Incontinence management, uh, we can do uh, uh, urine uh, toileting training or bowel training and this is just kind of like what you do with it uh, with a child you take them at the most opportune time is always after breakfast um, because they've had something to eat and they've had some coffee usually um, most people are on that routine but also to uh, uh, we will take them probably every two hours see if they can empty if you um, worked in the long-term care facilities you probably noticed them taking um, the residents uh, toileting at certain times throughout the day and so we try to get um, a, a training system down keeping up fluids um, proper diet exercise and uh, taking them to the restroom every two hours trying to get them on a schedule uh, last last um, case scenario is invasive procedures or surgery if needed and sometimes it is needed. In your activity sheet um, I have some um, some of these meds here so please make sure that you look some of those up and understand what they are and what they're for. You can use your textbook or you can look them up on uh, Procrates and be ready with these in class to discuss in groups. Um, laxatives, um, there's different types. We have our bulk form forming agents. This is like Metamucil, Acilium. It's important that your patient knows to drink uh, plenty of fluids with this. Bowel stimulants can be like your um, your cathartic slash laxatives um, that are a little bit a little bit more harsh uh, on the on the system and helps to expel uh, forceful, forcefully. Um, uh, any kind of stool that's in the intestine and in the colon and rectum. Uh, lubricants may be used um, to help to add moisture to help for easier passage. Um, the bowel stimulants too also are uh, will pull fluid from the mucosa of the intestinal lining, lining as well so it's easy for these patients to get dehydrated or constipated if they're overused. The other thing we have are saline laxatives and it may be a saline um, enema or a soap suds enema and this is hung on an IV pole and it's a thousand liter bag that's hung and the end of the, the tip um, is lubricated and inserted into the rectum. The patient lies sideways and um, uh, 
we will insert the fluid. The higher the bag, the faster the flow. So you want to start low and work your way up a little bit. And if your patient ever says they're in pain, you stop immediately. There to hold that as long as possible. And then I usually have a bedside commode, um, uh, a bedpan, and lots of towels and pink pads um, to uh, protect the floor and the bed. And uh, I get out of the way. Um, if they do want to go to the bathroom, make sure they have a clear path. Um, also, too, with um, um, some of your other uh, bowel stimulants, too, maybe like a Fleet's enema. And it is uh, also inserted through the rectum. And it's um, a, a plastic, soft plastic a bottle that you actually push, squeeze the fluid in. And you keep rolling it up till you get as much of it in as possible. The Ducosate is one of your stool softeners that we'll see. Um, helps to soften the stool. Uh, sometimes patients do have to go on antibiotics if they have some type of bacteria or, bacteria or infection. Antispasmodics, this could be something like Imodium, helping to prevent diarrhea. And um, analgesics uh, can also be used, uh, especially patients who have had some type of hemorrhoidectomy or something like that, and they're very uncomfortable. For the urine, um, antibiotics, of course, we want to make sure we have the correct antibiotic if a patient has an infection or um, uh, of the kidney or the bladder. Antispasmodics to help um, with the bladder spasms, and sometimes we can use uh, peridium. can be used for that, but it's also an analgesic that we can also um, have our patients take as well, and so that um, helps with that burning and urgency and again with those uh, bladder spasms. Remember if your patient is on peridium to warn them that their urine will be orange um, so it doesn't scare them. So um, please make sure they do know that. Again, when we have a patient who's incontinent, um, we need to make sure that we do that training and retrain the bladder and the bowel on when to go on a regular basis. Um, sometimes it's timed every two hours or they're prompted um, to go. Uh, sometimes we um, can use little tricks such as running the water. Um, putting their hand in some water. Uh, I've even had patients that I've had uh, get up into the shower and let warm water hit on them and, and just let them uh, void in the shower just to be able to empty their bladder. Use of protective pads, whether it's in their um, Depends or a pad that goes in their pants um, or protective pads on the bed to help save their bed. Skin care, I'm going to make sure we have some type of protective barrier um, to protect their skin and make sure they know to do um, peri care and uh, make sure they stay clean and dry. This slide we're going to actually wait until you get into med surge, so this one will be coming later. And this one will be later on too as well. So as we start putting things together now, as you can see, when we have the concept of in, um, elimination, now we can start using some of our other concepts such as nutrition and how it can affect elimination and uh, cognition, how that can affect elimination. It can also affect mobility and how it affects nutrition. The same thing with mobility can um, be affected by cognition and mobility can actually be um, affect elimination. Um, another one I want to add in with elimination is safety. You know, is our patient getting up a lot at night with nocturia? And um, we may be um, having to make sure they stay safe and have a bedside commode, have a nightlight um, to assist them. Um, so that might be a, an issue. Uh, with nocturia, we usually um, have the patient not drink after a certain time at night. On the average, we say two hours before they go to bed, but if they're still having a lot of nocturia, we may bump it back to every you know three or four hours before they go to bed. It just depends on that patient. Um, so those uh, that's how we're starting to take our concepts and kind of bring them all together. And uh, when you're working with your patients, that you're dealing with all these concepts at the same time, and sometimes we don't even realize it till we actually break it down like this, and like, oh wow, I am doing that. This is all I have um, 
for your PowerPoint. I do want to tell you, and I think this is very important, so I hope you did listen uh, to this PowerPoint. If you didn't, you're not getting this information. But if you will go into Blackboard and go under Assignments, uh, when you click that, you'll go down to where it says the HESI um, remediation. And you click that open, and you're going to see some instructions about the HESI test. And after you um, take your HESI test, when everyone has completed it, we'll, um, we can finally release the uh, actual score breakdowns. And once you have the score breakdown, um, you can look um, at the form, and you'll see that there's two contracts. One's your initial contract, and then one is the final contract. The initial, so they're going to have you go down and look and see what was your weakest area, I believe, I'm doing this off the top of my head, um, but what was the weakest area in um, under the nursing process? So was it evaluation? Was it um, uh, planning? Was it assessment? Was it the interventions? Um, so what what was that and you identify that then you're going to look at um, your client needs and you're going to identify those uh, your lowest one there and then you're going to find the section where it has concepts and you're going to identify your three lower concepts and these are areas that you need to work on um, in the future if you scored at 850 that means you did pass and you still have one remediation to do and what that remediation is is a 10, 10 questions from EAQ. You set that up, you answer that, you need to pass with an 80. If you don't, you need to repeat. Um, and once you've done that, you bring it to me again or send it to me and I'll sign the second approval. I do need that first one first. Um, and then the initial contract, I need that one before you go on. And after I give the approval for that, you do your second. You give me all those forms, and they go into your permanent file. If you did not pass on the first time, on the last sheet of paper, when you scroll all the way down, you'll see the last sheet, you will see the breakdown of scores. So you find out what your score was, and that will tell you what you need to do for your remediation. You can pick any HESI case study in there. You can pick out, um, you, you have your questions, and it gives you the number of these assignments to do. You have two weeks to do this until you um, have to have it done to be able to take your retake. Once you've done the remediation, I've signed it, and I see that you did it. You do your second retake test. And if you pass it, you will get a 90. If you don't pass the second retest, there is no more remediation to do, and your final your grade for the HESI will be an 80%. That is the lowest grade you can get. The other thing is, though, if you're not passing and you're struggling, please own your own time you need to go back and review. So when you're on breaks, when you have um, a holiday breaks between semesters, weekends, um, whatever it may be, use this time to go back through and re start reviewing um, for your HESI and see where your weak areas are so you don't get behind. Um, once we, if you did sign up to take the HESI today on Thursday, the snow day, uh, what we'll do is, as uh, soon as I find out the makeup day, I will get that sent out to you. Um, we were scheduled to do retakes um, two weeks after tomorrow, um, which would be week 15, which is the last week of classes uh, of the semester. So as soon as I find out uh, when the retake is uh, date, I will let you know so we can get everything underway. Um, I believe that is it. Um, if you have any questions, please contact me. Um, I'll be um, around until about 2 o'clock on Friday, and um, I will be back on campus Monday if you have any questions. I'm in simulation for about six and a half hours on Monday, and I'm away on Tuesday at another campus uh, for an all-day meeting. But um, I will check emails off and on until uh, Wednesday morning, and then I'm going to kind of be offline there for a little while. Um, but uh, 
you should have everything you need for now. We'll do our, some activities in class, so I'll be posting some things for you to do. So please pay attention under your course documents folder for elimination for updates, and we'll continue on with ballot elimination um, uh, next week. All right. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and I will see you in two weeks.